Hi, I'm Jake. I make role-playing supplements and Pathfinder 2 videos. Mostly Pathfinder 2 videos as opposed to anything else. But I love Pathfinder 2, or PF2, and I'm honored today to have one of the original founders of Pathfinder, Mark Seifter, on the channel. Thank you for being here, man. I really appreciate your presence and your willingness to, like, go over, like, breaking down how to incorporate Pathfinder 2's mechanics into a more home-constructed game, because that's primarily going to be our focus today. Yeah, absolutely. I always, always have loved homebrewed, home-constructed games and um, creating new content for your group, or uh, whether that be homebrew or third party, which are, you know, separate, but very, very important. I say that as someone who now is working on a third party, but even before I was, I always considered them to be very important. I feel like I've talked about that a lot throughout my time uh, at Paizo, and I'm a strong proponent of homebrew and house rules. Yeah, I noticed uh, the last, I think it's the last video you put out. Now you were talking about how to adjudicate a situation in which a feat could be applicable, but the person doesn't have the feat. Was that your most recent? That was two videos ago, oh. yes. Um, the most recent was Drastic Measures, which is what to do when, you know, we have like 83 GM advice videos, and they usually give you advice that's like, okay, let's talk, and we'll figure out a good compromise, and we can do a social contract, and but... We recognize that sometimes you do the thing that we said in those videos and it doesn't work. And you have to escalate to drastic measures. So we made a video about what are the most drastic things you can do and how can you try to do those respectfully or in a way that has a higher chance of your campaign not falling apart. Keeping in mind awesome. that it still has a decent chance of falling apart if you have to go to drastic measures. I love that. That's really cool. I was just talking with somebody uh another YouTuber, it doesn't matter, um, earlier today about doing a video about um, how you remove a toxic person from the game. And it's not like, well, let's settle and all of us have a roundtable discussion exposing our feelings or whatever, but it was basically you, you take that person aside to a separate room and say, hey, this is a problem, you need to do something about it, here's the issue and here's what's going to happen if you don't resolve this. And then if they don't resolve it, kick them out of the group. It's for the health of the group. So drastic measures, I'm a supporter of. Sometimes it's absolutely necessary, including sometimes blowing up the group and then reconnecting the other people that were not problems back into the group to continue anyway. Yeah, we had blowing up the group as one of the drastic measures. <laughs> Sadly, sometimes it happens because people are rather random. Honestly, just group dynamics, leadership, communication, all very important skills throughout your life and ones that you will learn from, uh, for better or for worse, from um, creating and setting up lots of tabletop role-playing games with your groups. Yeah, totally true. It's You learn by pain. The more mistakes you make, the better you get at it, and that's the most direct path, the fastest path, and sadly the path that most of us have to take. You learn by failure. That's why um, something like Burning Wheel or Mouse Guard, where you have to fail and succeed a certain number of times in a skill before you can level it up, is probably more realistic than in Pathfinder, where you could theoretically have succeeded every thievery check that you ever rolled from level 1 through level 20 and have never f met a failure. I didn't know those systems work that way. I like that a lot. Yeah, you learn more from failure than from winning. And like the the my live stream a couple of sessions ago, there was a giant shadow worm that is you know twentieth level. I dumped it down to fifteenth, and this right. group of eleventh level adventurers was trying to kill it, and they failed. And I'm like, okay, you level. It makes sense to me. Yeah, yeah, I like it too because if you're teaching a new players with one of those kinds of systems where you need failures to advance or failures to do something good. It teaches them a different psychology about how sometimes you succeed and sometimes you fail, and they can both be helpful in, to your character and to the story. Whereas one's more like, I love Pathfinder 2. I mean, I co-created it and put in things that I liked into it somewhat. But it is very much a, like, if you failed, that was bad. It could do something funny if you're into that kind of thing and you love the idea that the critical failure did this hilarious thing. My group does. but. 
new players can be taught the idea that it's just purely negative and they should try to succeed, succeed all the time. And some of those other RPGs can teach a different lesson. It's interesting because that can also end up being a toxic mindset that you are only mm-hmm. okay if you continuously succeed. Yes. I gotta ask, why is your screen name Rogue Eidolon? Is there a story? I mean, a little bit, I guess. So, there is a creature in the Dungeons and Dragons Monster Manual 2 for 3.5 that was called Rogue Eidolon, which I believe was actually created by James Jacobs back in the day. Oh. Um, And not only that, but I was someone who had played back in the 3.5 ghost walk setting there's an eidolon class for ghosts and in pathfinder first edition and second edition eidolons are something that a summoner can summon and my first uh pathfinder two or pathfinder one character sorry was a summoner with an eidolon so it was a play on all of those rogue eidolons because you could be a rogue who also had the eidolon class as a um a ghost i technically didn't but there was not a monster with the name of my class and that and um then also the summoner who had an eidolon okay yeah i used to love the rogue eidolon uh in 3.5 mainly because it was weird it was very weird for sure pardon um okay so I guess the most efficient way to get to this is to ask. You had a significant role in creating the structure for the balance for the Pathfinder 2 game that we all know and love. And I know that you've come on different channels and spoken of that balance or mathematics and how to uh, work with the system as it is and how the system functions. Could you tell me how you would create something like out of your own imagination from scratch, or I guess inspired by anything else, even converted from 5e, and put it into Pathfinder 2 without damaging that really delicate balance? Okay, sure. So um, I think it is fair to say that like the balance and the math of the system are things that like other designers would probably agree that I was very deeply involved with um, in terms of Pathfinder 2. So I would say that I wouldn't characterize the game as delicate per se, or at least the only reason you might consider it to be delicate is that it actually is balanced, whereas things that are already completely imbalanced in the first place are very indelicate because you could almost throw anything in there and they're not going to be more imbalanced than they already are. They'll just kind of be equally imbalanced with more imbalanced stuff that's in there at that point. So in a sense, any system that's balanced is like in threat of just going off the deep end that other systems already are in. I can see that. But I think that the structure behind Pathfinder 2 is generally pretty resilient as long as you don't mess with like giving like a lot of numbers boosts arbitrarily like beyond what the system normally does or like change the action economy a lot as long as you don't do one of those two things the system is fairly resilient you can see that because i said before in this um interview i like homebrewing i like variant rules so you know i wrote the variant rules chapter in game mastery guide and there's some in there like free archetype that that's a huge power boost But also, as I wrote in the Free Archetype variant, you probably don't have to actually adjust your encounters that much, if at all, for the Free Archetype, even though it's a That's a pretty big power boost. It's 10 free feats, but the system's so resilient that it can completely accept those 10 free feats without, like, it doesn't break. You might not even have to adjust your encounters, and if so, maybe only by a little, not even by a whole level, even though you've increased the number of feats by that amount. Mm-hmm. I think that's a hallmark of a resilient system. I would say, um, now I wanna answer your question more about like how you go about like converting your idea or even a fifth edition uh, rule into Pathfinder 2. So first of all, 
I usually prefer converting Pathfinder 2 into 5th edition. That being said, I have professionally converted 5th edition into Pathfinder 2 before as well. Oh. In general, the most important thing to um, that you need to know is that there is a sort of a siren song of the easy way out where you kind of look at the thing that you have from 5th edition or wherever it is and you're like, well, the most similar thing to this in Pathfinder is that so i'll just keep it the same and change what i need to change the bare minimum so that it is now written in pathfinder it does a cromulent legal thing to do in pathfinder now because i've changed the terminology and now i'm done so that is the one thing you should never do when you're converting you should never um, do that instead yeah you should never do that when you're converting you never, ever, ever um, just take the thing from 5e and be like, oh, this thing says that you can gain advantage on all your attack rolls with swords. Okay, I'm going to make it so that it's a fortune effect. And anytime I make attack rolls with swords, I roll twice and take the higher result. Perfect. I just converted it into a, a legal Pathfinder 2 expression that completely follows the rules of the game. And is a terrible decision to have made. I hear that, so, on that example, um, yeah. Right? And so instead, what you want to do is look at what's going on in the 5e rule. And we have some examples of this in the Role for Combat Live episode with Linda and Nathan Barling, the paleontologist, when we're talking about um, what happened in the Dr. Trollin's Dictionary of Dinosaurs, a over 300-page book that Linda, who is also one of the you know, head honchos it, um, Paizo for PF2 since she was in charge of the narrative department. Uh, she converted or is in the process of converting that entire book. And the idea is you go through, you read it, you understand what the 5e rules are doing and you understand what the high concept is. What's cool about it? What makes the encounter fun? What is in your mind's eye painting a picture? And then you rebuild a completely new creature from scratch in Pathfinder 2 using your own new math and try to make sure everything that you thought of when you were thinking of what makes this cool is included in that new creature. But that it also follows, and this is like for a creature, but you can do it for a feat or a spell or a magic item, but that it also follows the standards of Pathfinder 2. So you wouldn't give some feature that makes you roll twice and take the higher on all attack rolls with swords, or probably not. That if, if that existed, it would be like ridiculously high level or situational for a very short period of time. Whereas in D and D, they might easily just give that to you all the time yeah. for something. Like Pathfinder, it might be once per day. Yeah, for example, it'd be like you enter your sword move ability and then once per day for a certain, maybe until the end of your next turn, all those attacks are um, rolling twice and taking the higher result. Exactly. So you you want to compare it to similar things in Pathfinder 2 to see where you're at. Or if like it was from, let's say, a game system that uses more bonuses as opposed to 5e, maybe you were converted from Pathfinder 1 and you saw um, in Pathfinder 1, there was something, it was called like Akashic Form or something like that, which, um, let me see if that is the correct um, name for the thing. No, that's the one that makes you come back to life. Well, there was something with a similar name. Maybe it was Akashic Communion or, uh, no, that's not it. There, it. Anyway, it gave you a like plus 25 or... 20 or whatever your caster level was we'll just say 25 to all your d20 checks for like a minute and it was obviously quite busted but so were many other spells at the time yeah um if you were trying to convert that you wouldn't give a plus 25 in pathfinder 2 you would probably look and be like okay well this was it was a very high level spell but also like nine rank heroism is a plus three yeah uh, not a plus 25. <laughs> so I'm going to take into account What's that status bonuses, <laughs> status bonuses maybe would be closer to that plus 3 rather than the plus 25 and um, go from there. So it's very important to just basically take what's cool from the high concept, from the feel of playing it, from like what's cinematic in your mind's eye, and then transfer it to the new game system by rebuilding 
in the new game systems sort of idea space. So that's my that's my pitch for that. Okay, that makes sense. And I basically committed a sin against what you just said. Recently in a live stream, I took a 3.5 epic level Fane and put it directly into, as far as I could figure the matching up the numbers, um, a, an, an 11th level adventure. But I didn't really care, because it was supposed to be an NPC that points the way to where they're going. He's not supposed to be a combatant. So in that case... Well, then it doesn't really matter right. if they don't actually fight it then. <laughs> but his powers are interesting, because, like, some of those powers are overpowered for Pathfinder 2. Like, every turn, everyone around them has to make a will save to get a turn. <laughs> That's a little much. Yeah, that's pretty nasty. I think if you were actually fighting that, that being, you might want to have paid more close attention to the standards of Pathfinder 2. But again, since it was just pointing the direction, you didn't have to fight it. That's just sort of the idea where you can just do some weird stuff without even explaining it if it's just kind of for ambiance. And yeah. um, that should normally be fine. I think if I have them fight it, I'm just a jackass at that point. I just give up and accept that I'm a jerk. Um, so you have <laughs> done some conversation about, uh, had some conversation about familiars on a couple of different channels, and I wrote my own scripts about familiars. Uh, I did a couple of videos on them. I had a player who wanted to have Doctor Strange's Cape, uh, cloak of Levitation. So maybe we could use that as an example. And essentially, I said, well, that's not really an animated object. You couldn't, he couldn't really carry you, but I guess if you sink all of your extra feats into familiar feats, then sure, he can have the power of essentially both a familiar and an animated object, plus be able to carry you to fly. I know that's a little overpowered, at least. But how would you have done it? How would uh, you have manipulated so the system to be able to create such a thing? I would say that absolutely, definitely, something that is just carrying you to fly on its own turn is... That's the part of what you said that was overpowered. Everything else about it didn't sound like it was it was that far of base. I would say that you could look at, like, the Kitsune Star Orb or something like that and basically just be like, yeah, the idea of these familiars is that you can just be what you want to be. So I would look at like the tattoo or some of those other familiars that let you turn them into something that's on you or on your body that's not doing anything. And or the mask familiar uh, that was from Magambia that can turn into a mask on your face and create a cloak familiar familiar ability that was kind of just like that. Then you wouldn't even have to take any feats in my game. You just grab this cloak familiar ability that's the, a reskin of the mask ability from Magambia and it can turn into a cloak on your back or come off and just be flapping around as a cloak or whatever. It would not make you fly around on, on its turn because that's just a, a very obnoxious ability to, um, to have, especially on an independent familiar. Yeah, um, independent. Was that the problem? But even if it wasn't... Go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, even if it wasn't one action to fly twice when you probably shouldn't have even had flying yet uh, at all is um, is quite a lot of of shenanigans. Um, okay. But like that is not about an animated object on a familiar though. That's about like gaining the ability to just accelerate your actions while flying, which is a totally different kind of worm. So the animated object we'd already have completed by putting the like more extensive mask. Um, swap ability on and just be like, yeah, there you go. It's technically, like, alive. Like, it's not going to have some of the construct immunities. If I wanted to make it a specific familiar, I'd look at some of the other constructs, like Poppet familiar and some of those and um, math it out uh, a little bit based on that. And, you know, hey, it has the turn into a cloak ability as one of the required um, familiar abilities on it or something like that. I think it should be relatively simple to do an object familiar when you get into a familiar that's just flying you around on its own turn that, to me that's more of a like we probably shouldn't do this or it would be a very high level feat how high level would that be for comparison we were 11th level well um 
let's see. The Thaumaturge has a very similar feat to that. And um, the Thaumaturge's feat that you have essentially an item, right, that's flying you around. It's your implement is oh gosh let me see let me see i need to use my archives of nethys here although it only is showing me some of the feats i can scroll up uh, implements flight is a 16th level feat and even then it gives you a fly speed it's not like you can spend one action to fly twice or um have an independent thing just fly while you're not doing anything okay i got gotcha. you now would those feats potentially move down due to the fact that there's been substantial power creep on ancestry flight feats? Maybe, although you do have to take three feats in general or three things to get those ancestry flight feats. Um, I would say that given that I designed the Thaumaturge and if I was designing it again now, given the power creep on the ancestry flight feats, I probably would move down implements flight by to at least 14. Um, and maybe even lower than that, given that there's a, a one five nine, but that might just be a race to the bottom. It depends on like how vociferous the game is going to be about assuming everybody is perma flying at level nine in terms of <laughs> rebuilding all of the adversaries around that level range to make sure that there's not a lot of very disappointing encounters where you can't do anything. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, what I did was clearly unbalanced. It was overpowered. Um, it functioned, but not because like, of the animated object part. Oh no, no! About the flying, it was really the flying. Uh, the flying was the fantasy. Oh, that it's wanted. always the flying. <laughs> it's always the flying in in any game system. It's always the flying. Look, I was playing um, a game that like another YouTuber was was making and is still making uh, their own game, and they had me play. It was not one that was like a a game that was broadcast, and I played like a, an owl person who could fly and i flew over everything <laughs> i was never attacked even if i had been attacked i had a 90 percent chance or something like that to dodge everything and then even after that i had a massive amount of damage reduction i was so far from being harmed by anything that happened during the entire adventure and then and we completed everything and then afterwards he was like yeah Hmm, that flying really did bypass like everything. <laughs> Cause it was one it was one where you could just fly it, you know, with your starting character. Yeah, and I've noticed that. That is just tends edition. to be the case. I've noticed that in fifth edition there are a couple of ways that you can do that, and that seems really frustrating for the GM. Um this character that we're talking about that got the cape, the cloak, who did happen to be a thaumaturge, uh, he restricted himself. So he um, he only used the cloaks flying very minimally, and I had to encourage him to use the cloak whenever he wanted because it's fun. And that's where my style as GM comes in, and I don't care all that much about many things that are overpowered because they make the game more fun. I can always respond to it if I need to, and it gives me more leeway to do over-the-top stuff in other ways. Generally, it's pretty easy if you, the GM, made something that was overpowered, especially if you told the players first, hey, I'm making this, I might have to change it later on, but we're just going to try it. It's worse if the game designers and the game system does the overpowered thing, uh, because then you, the GM, have to be like the uncool parent who's just like, well, maybe we can't, maybe you should stop using this thing that's in there, though. But, but mom slash the... Um, you know, the game book says I can do it. <laughs> and so I think it's better if the game book is kind of the strict parent. So the GM, like you in this case, can be the cool parent who's just like, yeah, sure. Because honestly, in your game, it probably didn't mess anything up because they're playing it like Doctor Strange where the cloak is unreliable and very moody and might not go where you want it to go. I Whereas if I that, had that, yeah. um, if I had that a power, I would use it to avoid every trap and hazard that you designed and all of the monsters that didn't have substantial <laughs> flying or ranged abilities. And that's just that's just what I would do if I had it. That's because um, I don't always build the character that's the strongest, but with the abilities I have, I try to get into the head of that 
character living in that world who's in a life or death situation and try to use what I have in character in a way that seems like it would be the most effective and the safest. So my characters are sometimes more cowardly than um, than other people of their class because I try to think like if I was actually in this situation, would I want to take that risk or would I try to do something a little safer? Yeah, everything is life threatening in a role playing game. <laughs> Um, but you were right that I... Unless I intentionally play a reckless character, then then all bets are off. I would love to see you play a reckless character, because I'm having trouble picturing the personality you would insert into it. Um, but the, uh, the cloak, I did have the cloak basically do what it wanted. Like, if it thought there, that uh, the Thaumaturge Raven was the character's name, if it thought that Raven was in danger, it would fly the opposite direction. Or if there was something that it thought that Raven should be doing, it'd fly toward it. So sort of like when yeah. Doctor Strange just got the cloak. It's like, no, use this over here. And he's like, what? What? He occasionally took the cloak off. <laughs> yeah. And it's a significant drawback if it sometimes takes you where you don't want to go. <laughs> Whereas if it's just basically the player is mind controlling this thing and using it to just get lots of free movement or double movement for one action that's flying is a totally different story in that case yeah so that's why i highly encourage as i said at the start of the episode people to homebrew and experiment themselves because a lot of the times the system is sturdy enough that when you do something that yeah we, you know you and i agreed it was overpowered but did it break the game no it didn't break your game it wouldn't be good to include that option in the published books because then uh, either everybody has to deal with it or they have to like self-impose the ban, but it's a great idea of something that you could add in. I'm glad you were so thorough about how to incorporate, I guess I'm glad that you're thorough when you speak anyway. Like you, you talk about all aspects of what I'm mentioning. So I'm glad that you went from the beginning about how to create something brand new in the system how to convert something from 5e or from a different system and then how to use a specific example that that i actually had come up in my game i just thank you for going over it in so much detail stop licking my wrist <laughs> sorry i have kitties <laughs> it's okay all the viewers are gonna want to watch the kitties it's gonna <laughs> up the clicks I actually had... They're more interesting than me. <laughs> I swear, I think that some people just watch the channel for the cats. Like, some people say, I came for the info, stayed for the cat. <laughs> it's like, yeah, they came for the cats. There's this Jake guy who's on here too, I think, but, like, mostly the cats. <laughs> I like that, I think. <laughs> um, okay, so let me see what I wanted to ask next. Oh, um... So how, okay, so if you want to take the animated object ritual and give it intelligence and let it have familiar feats, would there be any problem with that, generally speaking? Because I know that that's sort of combining things into one creature, so it would have more options for actions, but it would ultimately have fewer actions than both an animated object and a familiar separately. I generally just wouldn't do that. I would just say, just use the regular familiar roles with like a familiar ability, as I mentioned before. The animated object has a lot of very specific things about it for like the monster animated object that aren't really true about a familiar. So I would just say, just make a familiar. And if you want to, also make it an animated object separately. And then you can have the two separately so you don't have to, um, sort of get into the overlap in any weird ways. Okay, I gotcha. It would be more clear and obvious how to do that because the systems already exist for so, for that thing. And basically the familiar is meant to be very flexible so that you can just say it is what it is. You don't need to wait for like Paizo to publish an octopus to have an octopus, for example. That was a problem back in Pathfinder 1 and yeah. that is in a lot of systems with familiars where not only did you have to wait for that but also if you really really wanted to play certain animals but they didn't have the most overpowered familiar ability and their familiar ability wasn't good for the character it's like well this animal is the perfect animal for my character but it gives plus three to like bluff which my character is never going to do because they're a wizard and they use intelligence and they do not have bluff Yeah, and it's like oh man <laughs> 
Whereas in Pathfinder 2, you can just have the animal that you want to have, and you do not have to be, like, using just, like, there's a hundred familiars, but there's, like, six of them that have the best mechanical benefits that are played at 40 to 60% of all tables. Yeah. That was the case for years, playing 3.52. Yep. Um, so I want to talk about Battle Zoo a little bit. I have not bought any of the Battle Zoo books yet. There's been some mm-hmm. information available online about Battle Zoo. I think it's mostly just the dragons. And they Well the dragons are are on Path Builder. Um that's just innately yeah. on Path Builder. That's right, yeah. And it looked like they're playable. I've read them through. They do seem playable. They don't seem overpowered or underpowered. Uh do you think that there is a more powerful or less powerful specific ancestry that came out aside from the dungeon, obviously. <laughs> a more powerful or less powerful specific right. ancestry about on par? that came out. Oh, um, yeah. I would say that, in fact, if you did have the Battles of Ancestries Dragons book, then you would see my foreword at the beginning where I put in my personal guarantee that they will be balanced for your games or if they're not you can contact me and i will help you um figure out what to do That's because awesome. i'm very confident that um <laughs> they are balanced based on i okay so i'm gonna give a caveat which is that in the new dragon books that are coming out um like this year uh the pdfs are coming out they are orc and remaster compliant and because of the fact that you can get flying at ninth level now for very focused on flying ancestries the dragon has that and the exact way i worded my forward before is that i guarantee it's not going to cause you any balance problems in your game or you can contact me i'm probably going to need to change it to say that it won't cause any balance problems in your game something like except ones that would have also been caused by equivalent published options or something similar to that yeah so or it won't cause any in your game except maybe ninth level flying and in that case you're you're already gonna have to run into that with a lot of published options because i do think that ninth level flying could cause balance problems in a significant number of games but it also might not it depends on what monsters um you happen to be throwing at the group uh what the rooms or lack of rooms look like in that situation and it's mostly for like the 9 through 12 range where creatures are less likely to expect you to have um permanent flight yeah that makes sense i think that uh, the only time i've really run into a problem with flying is when the entire group had flying because then the entire group together Mm -hmm. bypasses everything i hate that that is that is yes Honestly, flying is one of the things, and I've talked about this before, that tabletop RPGs are kind of stuck with this very cumbersome flying that both, like you said, bypasses things and uh, makes certain situations unfun while also being extremely complicated to run in play, even if you are great at the Pythagorean theorem, which (laughs) many groups are not. It's the kind of thing that, like people like want to do it for fantasy but it just like makes the game slow down because you've got this third dimension that you have to deal with and it's much easier if the grid is on a two dimensions and if you're in a video game people would not blink at the idea that like there's a harpy and you're playing on like a tactical rpg and there the harpy is moving around the map and is flying but is just on the space next to your character and maybe there's a condition that gives them a defensive bonus against melee attacks or something like that yeah but other than that you don't have to be like you're 50 feet up and you've ignored you you've avoided the encounter or whatever but that would never really fly in most um very discreet tabletop rpgs and yes uh pun uh, somewhat intended uh because It doesn't give you the realism feel to players um, that if you actually had flying, shouldn't I just be able to fly over all of this? And that that runs into some issues that I've talked about in some previous interviews where people ask me, like, how much in the games like fun do you give up for realism? And my answer is 
the minimum amount that is necessary such that people don't get like a about the realism and it just constantly sticks in their craw at your table and once you've got past that bar then try to like work on gameplay and um and other things like that to improve the experience i agree with that level by the way and fantasy novels are the same way or any fiction if you are trying to wrap people into a story and you're trying to include fantastic elements then you only need to include as much realism as it takes to get the buy-in from the reader and same case here the buy-in from the player people do have to have a certain amount of realism to be able to put themselves inside that story but that's all Besides that, you can go crazy doing whatever you want. Now, for a novel or a published adventure, it's a little trickier because you have to be able to do that for everyone. But as a GM, you know your players. So you know, oh, yeah, all my players are chemists, so I need to figure <laughs> out when I said that the Black Dragon does sulfuric acid, I need oh. to figure out what, how that will react to all the metals that are in these shields or whatever. My players are not chemists. They're actually, most of them are... Um, uh, like MIT physics PhDs. So I need to make sure I understand quantum physics if I use it. <laughs> Only quantum physics, though. That's uh, I've, I've talked about this in other interviews, but when I was new at Paizo, people were asking me, uh, Ele Air Elemental's Whirlwind says its height, but it doesn't say its volume or how much space it takes up on the battlefield. That's pretty important since it can pick creatures up in Pathfinder 1. Do we, um, so they asked, what would the volume be? So I asked all my physics people, and they were like, Mark, fluid dynamics is not our area of physics. It's quantum. <laughs> we do not know what the volume of this air elemental whirlwind is. That is it's funny. It's a very, um, very classic expert uh, answer. Yes, it was. I actually had one guy who was a chemist, and he convinced me that certain things should work certain ways and I was 22 and frankly stupid at least when it comes to people didn't understand how to relate or find middle ground or anything I'm just like oh okay that makes sense then sure you can cast grease and create napalm somehow so depending on your group what you have to do for that um, realism might change by a lot. Uh, but um, for, for a standard group, you don't have to go that far in chemistry or physics or things like that. Um, I just realized that we didn't talk about how long we were going to talk, and I'm sorry if it's going on long. I, I, I'm okay talking a little bit longer if you're okay with that. Sure. Until okay. you're done. I want to know how... Okay, so, like, I have had this whiteboard with these two projects for quite a long time, and I don't know how to make them come to life. One of them is um, a construct ancestry that is the ragamuffin or tattered amalion, if you're familiar with that creature, and mm -hmm. how, how their ancestry feats would work. And aside from that, a harpy ancestry. We were just talking about harpies and flight, and I know that that would be a problem... How do you begin? I mean, you could just do what you did with what what they did with Strix and and other ancestries. It'd be fine. Okay. All right. I didn't realize I, I could just like copy that structure. Yeah. Well, I mean, Paizo did right. They even eroded backwards that structure onto multiple other ancestries um, that were an ancestry guide just like a month or two ago, right? Yeah. So I would just use that structure because it seems like what they're using moving forward um, and that that should be fine for the flying. And then you may want to look into like um, the orc harpies, which are, let me look at them. Yeah, so orc harpies are more similar to a um, the actual harpies from Greek mythology because Greek mythological harpies were storm spirits. And so these have hungry winds instead of having that song, the siren song, which okay. is basically only in D and D and like the harpies from mythology did not do a siren song. Sirens did siren song. Right. So, um, it didn't make any sense to me that harpies have sirens song. It's not harpy song. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess it's not called siren song on them, but um, the, the fact is they have a, ability that like we're not mythologically part of them so if you're doing a, a pathfinder one i would just lean into the storm spirit aspect even beyond 
giving them something similar to the Hungry Winds ability or their Winds Whisper ability that they have in Monster Core. You could just give them air and probably lightning abilities because while they don't have the electricity trait in uh, Monster Core, like that, th that storm aspect and electricity was part of their like mythological origin. And so you could definitely build an ancestry around that. I don't think it would be too tricky. Um, if you want to do a Ragamuffin or a Tattered Demalion, like that one... My biggest issue with that be, is the Discorporation. Yeah, it's going to be a little bit weirder. I would say that what you might want to do is use something like the Automaton for the the constructness, and then something like the the Swarm Blood uh, Ancestry from Battle Zoo um, Ancestry's Year of Legends, which oh. is a person who has like a swarm inside of them instead of blood and fluids. Yeah, okay. And they can like have the swarm come out and do stuff, but they, they still have a body, but they also have a swarm and they have some high level abilities to just flat out go into the swarm mode and do something like that. Um, for I would say for a tattered Demalion slash uh, ragamuffin style um, creature, so that it still has some of the expectations of a corporeal character with some of the flavor of having this all this weird stuff going on. That would be and so I would say take a look at that one from Year of Legends. It's coming out. That one is the September Ancestry, and um, it's by Jessica Redicop and. I, mean, I developed all the ones that are in there, and they're all great. Steven uh, Glicker, who is the publisher for World for Combat, really likes the Swarm Blood too. So um, it would probably be a good thing to look at if you're if you're working on a, a ragamuffin. Obviously, you're not gonna take exactly what's in there, although um, it is legal by Orc to do so if you cite the Orc product that you're using something from. Oh, that's cool. I'm glad. I don't understand legal terms, so I'm glad to be told that. Thank you. <laughs> well, in, with Orc or OGL, though, you make sure you're using the right one. In this case, it would be Orc. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Swarm Blood is actually OGL. No, I'm okay. backing up, backing up. So you won't be able to one. use it because it's, o it's OGL. You won't be able to use it. The reason it's OGL, by the way, is because some of the other ancestries from that book are based on OGL monsters. So oh, okay. back up, don't put it into an orc product. But you still can look at it for inspiration oh, of totally. how that type of concept is done. You would just make your own. And that's probably what you would have done anyway. But technically, yeah. with OGL and orc, if you are in the same license, you can um, you can even go so far as to cite it and use something in full. The guidelines of how the structure would be balanced in the system is my re really my main concern. I've actually been asking for over a year. I've asked three different YouTubers to talk to me about that, and you're the first person who's been willing to give me their opinion on it, so I, I appreciate it. The ragamuffin is near and dear to my heart. Fair enough. Well, most people won't have already gone through a swarm blood just recently, so... <laughs> True. I started writing a novel with her as my main hero. I got, I don't know, 20 pages in, and I'm like, this is taking too long. I need to do something else. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I do want to know more personally about you. Just like, I feel like you're this faceless concept out there that most people don't really get to know who you are. And remember, everybody, he has a YouTube channel, Arcane Mark. And he has some very useful and also interesting content there. I've been watching some of his videos. What games do you play on or off your channel? And um, how do you run your games, generally speaking, for those that haven't seen those videos? So, yeah, I mean, I have a game that I ran. The, if, if you look in the links below, which maybe has a link to my channel, I don't know, since we just talked about it. Yeah, well. Um, you can go and check the channel out. Um, but um, there's... A video called Co-Creator of Pathfinder 2 Runs for D&D YouTubers slash new players, parentheses, Pirate Assault for Kraken Week. And that is an example of me running Pathfinder 2. So you can see from there, like, people don't maybe expect it because I'm um, the guy who's known for math and for rules balance, but I have a very improvisational GM style. And for me, I like having a system that has my back 
because that lets me improv and I feel like I have this structure underneath me so that I can just go wild with improving but still be like wildly fair and consistent in a way that people can expect what my rulings are going to be because they're similar to rulings or things that they've seen in the book. So if they're experienced, they can be like, oh, that's kind of what I expected it might have been. Uh, yeah, as yeah, opposed to just that. like, yeah, as opposed to just like, well, who knows what it's going to be. And so like as a very improvisational style of um, running things, I like to have a, um, a structure that I can use. And even when I'm running a system that doesn't have that, I just make it myself in the background and and do something like that so that I can make sure I give consistent and fair rulings when I'm improv. Well, that's cool. And so the fact that the fact that I don't have to do that is very helpful for me in Pathfinder 2, but you know, it's not necessary. I've definitely run Pathfinder 1, which is not the easiest to run at very high levels and I ran it up to very high levels. Uh that took me many many hours to um to handle that that I no longer have to use in Pathfinder 2. People have quoted me correctly as saying that it takes me less time to run a Pathfinder 1 adventure in Pathfinder 2 than it does to run it in Pathfinder 1. Uh, including the time to convert to Pathfinder 2 Why? the adventure. Well, because Pathfinder 1 is on such an inconsistent baseline, we, let's um, well, let's ratchet back to when we talked about whether a system was fragile or not. And I said, there are some systems that are already just like, there's so much in it that's so busted that if you add another busted thing, you won't notice because it's a drop in the ocean. Um, Pathfinder 1 was a system that had such a variable power level of what was available that you would have baseline published content that some new players would play it and they would just get wrecked because it was easy to make a character that was almost worthless even though you you tried real hard and you paid attention to what it said you wanted to do and the character was just bad. Whereas at the same time, experienced players might be able to make a single character who would easily defeat with their eyes closed the entire adventure while a group of six inexperienced players just got constantly killed on the same published adventure. The power levels people played were very different. My group played at a pretty high power level. So in order to make sure that the adventure was suiting them, I needed to spend, you know, like uh... sometimes 12, 20 hours rewriting the tactics and spells and other things that the creatures were using, rebuilding a stat block from like, what is this even doing to this is a very, very uh, blisteringly strong version of the same idea. Um, whereas in Pathfinder 2, all I have to do is convert it to Pathfinder 2 using the basic monster building rule, which I can use very quickly. I have an unfair advantage having, you know, written them with Logan. So <laughs> I, they are written to a way that I can use them on the fly. But um, it's not even close how long it takes to, to run it in PF1 versus PF2, the PF1 adventures. So even if I didn't have that unfair advantage on building creatures, it would still be much shorter to run it on PF2 because I can just run it baseline and assume that the characters can participate in it at that point. Like when I was running my finale um, for one of my most r recent Pathfinder 1 adventure paths, there was an encounter and you fight like I can't remember exactly, but it's like there's like a level 14 like fightery guy and a level 14 oracle and there's like a, a wind oni in there and like maybe there's like a level 13 ninja in the room and like a few mooks. That's the original event encounter. So I buffed it so that the the fightery guy was level 20 and the oracle was level 18. The ninja was also higher level but they convinced him to leave which you can also do in the original huh. the oni was was buffed to a mythic uh beyond level 20 and i added um an additional two oni that also were mythic beyond level 20. oh my god and um put in a bunch of like uh 10th level bard mooks that could use heroic finale to give extra standard actions to any of the enemy characters and more mooks as well the characters one fairly easily but they all got to use their coolest abilities to shine to show off how good they were and um so it wasn't that they were close to dying but they did sometimes have the oh crap 
That ability that Emiya has is really unfair. Let's use our unfair ability to beat it. Uh, because some of the mythic characters had some unfair stuff. Like the wind guy had an ability where basically every time he attacked, he could like dimension door up to 60 feet away and attack you with each of his many attacks. And it left behind duplicates of him and he would flank with those duplicates and had sneak attack. Oh my God. But furthermore, Furthermore, if you attacked one of them, they would pop and go away. And when the last one was left, that was him. And oh, so okay. the group struggled, but you know, they popped all the ones in the room they were in and they all popped. And then the ninja was like, oh, okay. He had one more attack left that we didn't know about. And he went through a wall and just like attacked the air or like a box or something in another room didn't he and so then the ninja burst through the wall into the uh, into the other room where he suspected that the guy was and the guy was there and he's like you found me darn you or something like that and they um managed to defeat him and all the other people and then i gave a final form where it like had a head and two hands that were separate from each other in a ah! jrpg style yeah um, situation and like you know the left hand heals the up to fall and the right hand does offensive stuff and the head can regenerate the hands or whatever uh, and they all had a lot of fun but it was obviously spent took me like 30 hours to do this because I created tons of stat blocks as you can see I increased the number of creatures that were in the encounter by like times three or times four many of them were like seven levels higher than they were supposed to be or something like that and um, the party still won pretty easily, but they had a lot of fun with it. <laughs> That's a lot of work to put in. I see why you wouldn't try to make that conversion again. Yeah, it's easier to do it in VF2. Um, there is one other thing that I have a uh, question about, and I don't expect you to be prepared for this, so I apologize. This is mostly out of left field, but you said something on um, the... Actually, you said it. It was in that Kraken video play session that you mentioned. Um, mm -hmm. You mentioned that there's a sideboard about how to adjudicate actions. Actually, I think you also mentioned it in a video shortly after that. There was a sideboard about how yeah. to let somebody do an action that they don't actually have the skill for. And could you tell us like where that sideboard is or could you tell us of other little pieces that exist in the system that you like or you use that we don't know about because we don't read carefully and we just use archives of Nethys. Okay, so um, there's not actually a sidebar that specifically tells you how ex it doesn't like go in your face and say this is how to adjudicate not having a feat. But there is a sidebar that tells you how to adjudicate any situation that the players try to do something that, like, you don't know what it is. And um, this was found on Core Rulebook page 491. Now, where is it in the remastered books? I have no idea where it is in the That's remastered fine. books. To be perfectly honest, I know where it is in the Core Rulebook. Okay. It's, I'm sure it's somewhere. Um, and it says... And I quote, Core Rulebook 491, as the GM, you are responsible for solving any rules disputes. Remember that keeping your game moving is more important than being 100% correct. Looking up rules at the table can slow the game down, so in many cases, it's better to make your best guess rather than scour the book for the exact rule. It can be instructive to look those rules up during a break or after the session. You make calls on the fly, use the following guidelines, which are the same principles the game rules are based on. You might want to keep printouts of these guidelines and the DC guidelines for quick reference. Number one, if you don't know how long a quick task might take, go with one action or two action if a character shouldn't be able to perform it three times per round. Number two, if you're not sure what action a task takes, look for the most similar basic action. If you don't find one, make up an undefined action and add any necessary traits such as attack, concentrate, manipulate, or move. Number three, when two sides are opposed to each other, have one roll against the other's DC. Do not have both sides roll. Initiative is the exception to this rule. The character who rolls is usually the one who's currently acting, except in the case of saving throws. Number four, if an effect raises or lowers someone's chance of success, grant a plus one circumstance bonus or a minus one circumstance penalty. Number five, if you're not sure how difficult a significant challenge should be, use the DC for the party's level. Number six, 
If you're making up an effect, creatures should be incapacitated or killed on only a critical success or for a saving throw on a critical failure. Number seven, if you don't know what check to use, pick the most appropriate skill. If no other skill applies to a check to recall knowledge, use an appropriate lore skill, usually at an untrained proficiency rank. Number eight, it use the character's daily preparations as the time to reset anything that lasts roughly a day. Number nine, when a character accomplishes something noteworthy that doesn't have a rules for XP, award them XP for an accomplishment, 10 to 30. And number 10, when the PCs fail at a task, look for a way they might fail forward, meaning the story moves forward with a negative consequence rather than the failure halting progress entirely. That's a really great page. I have never just, read that. Just the top 10. <laughs> yeah, it, it's like one of the most important parts of the core rulebook, in my opinion, um, because it just makes very bare what some of the core fundamental principles that the rules were built upon are so that you can use those to improvise. And that is just what I was doing pretty much in that YouTube video that we're talking about is using those principles to come up with a solution when the YouTubers, three of whom had never played Pathfinder for before and I never told them how to play it, even at any point during the stream, I gave a brief primer at the beginning that you can see me yeah. giving where I roughly explained the three action economy, the four degrees of success, and the fact that multiple attack penalty exists, so you might not want to just strike, strike, strike. Yeah. That was all that I ever told them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I wrote those down as the most important things to present to people if they never played Pathfinder 2 before, because I saw you do it and it makes a lot of sense. Because that's always going to matter. If they have played extensively in 5e and not Pathfinder 2, if they haven't played anything, I would have told them more than that. But I knew that these oh, right. were three veterans of 5e who YouTubed with 5e and definitely knew what they were doing with 5e. And so... I focused on the three things that were most likely to trip up someone who really, really knew 5e but has not played Pathfinder 2. The, uh, it sounds like what you just read off is also a really good base for creating your own homebrew spells, effects, monsters. Sure. Yeah, it's, it's great for anything. That's It's a starting point to understanding the rules and why they are the way that they are. So. I consider it one of the most valuable portions of all of the core rulebook, and I, I think the other designers agree, which is why I'm confident it is somewhere in one of the two cores. I just don't know where it is because um, I happen to know where it is in the core rulebook due to using it a lot. Well, it'll probably be linked to remaster from Legacy on archives if I look up look it up. Maybe. It I don't know. I looked it up it on archives and I found I found the old one, but I'm not going to assume that that means that they got rid of it because there's no way. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I, I only that. found the old one and I did not find the new one. Okay. But I just think there's no way that that's gone because, like, when Logan and I were talking about that sidebar, I could tell like how important he also thought it was. So mm -hmm. I'm sure it's somewhere. I'm going to look it up on archives and put the link to that sidebar on archives in the uh, description below along with the link to your two videos that we talked about today. Of course, that'll Sounds also good. link to your channel. Uh, do you want to put any other links in the bottom in the description like a project you're working on or a personal web page? Well, I mean, I'm always working on stuff that's on battlezoo.com. Um, in general, I have heard that linking my videos is fine, but that um, you might want to link everything else in a comment that you pin to the top on the grounds that our great overlord, uh, the YouTube algorithm, would like everyone who is here watching us to watch YouTube forever. <laughs> and so therefore, um, if anything that's in the description that is a link to YouTube makes the algorithm very happy, whereas if it's a link to another page it makes it very <laughs> wroth indeed very good creepy overlord voices <laughs> <laughs> okay it's been a pleasure talking to you today cause like when I've seen you do interviews before it's pretty much only question and answer your judgment and it's very 
cold? This was very warm. I appreciate you being yourself and just relaxing and chatting for a while. Yeah, absolutely. I try to do that in interviews. But, you know, sometimes people ask very technical questions and right. I'm always being like, sorry, if it's this is an ambiguous rules adjudication, I'm not going to answer this. Times that you've seen me do it, when I was at Paizo, that's because I asked the entire design team and we had a whole meeting and they were answer exactly this way. And I was like, okay, I can do that. But normally I'll just have to give very technical answers or non-answers. But you know, when I'm in an, uh, an interview like this and we can just talk about philosophy or gameplay styles, then I'll try to answer it a little more um, casually. Good, I'm glad. I like the idea of meeting with you again and having no technical questions and we just talk about like strategies when doing role playing or how you get inside a character's head. That I think you might be better at than me. Cause like, I understand how the psychology of a creature can work, like an NPC. I build them up based on a, a fictional history. But as far as like, okay, so I had this one DM, he was in VTM, so technically he was a storyteller, but he did creepy crap. Like, when we were sitting around the table and there was supposed to be this mysterious effect around us, he would walk around the table and freaking whisper in our ears nothing that made any sense. And, like, keep walking around the <laughs> table. And he would only do it when we were talking, so we'd stop talking over and over again. It really set the mood right. I have no idea how to do that, especially digitally. So, anyway, talking about how to work with people in different ways, I'm very interested. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know. I'm going to exit now because I think my computer is crying. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Mark, stick around for a few minutes. I'll talk with you as long as my computer is still working. Thanks. Bye-bye. As long as your computer's not crying tears of blood. <laughs> 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 <laughs>